at uh, pretty much at you know at all your uh, local bookstores and online outlets. Uh, Rebecca's written for Audubon, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, the American Birding Association, many other outlets. She's going to be speaking next week at the San Diego Bird Festival, but we're delighted that tonight she's going to be speaking with us. Uh, quick reminder, as always, if you have questions for tonight's speaker, post them in the chat here on Zoom. But uh, with that, without further ado, uh, let's welcome uh, Rebecca Heisman. Hello, thank you. I'm going to share my screen here in just a moment. Let's see. Is this going to work? All right. Yes, this is this is what I wanted. This is to get get myself with the screen and with my slides in the background. So, Chris, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I, as Chris said, my name is Rebecca Heisman. I am coming to you from tonight from Eastern Washington. I was explaining to the leaders here just before we started that I'm about as far from Seattle as you can be and still be in Washington State. And I basically make a living writing about birds, which I didn't even know before I did it was a thing you could make a living doing, but it turns out it is, which is pretty fun. So as Chris said, I am here tonight because I'm the author of a forthcoming book on the history and science behind how we know what we know about bird migration. And I've spent the past two years of my life immersed in this topic. I've read more scientific papers than I can count. I've talked to dozens of scientists. I've got to join a few of them in the field to tag along while they've been carrying out their research. And it's really just been an amazing privilege. Um, I feel, to me, the scientists who appear in the book are the real experts on this topic. And I'm just really excited that I get to help share their stories and bring the amazing things that they're doing to a wider audience. And that's a really fun job to have because there are just so many good stories to tell about bird migration. Um, here are just a few of the amazing migrating birds that appear in my book. And I'm sure some of you are familiar with these already. We have here the bar-tailed godwit, which makes a nonstop flight from Alaska to New Zealand, which I still can't wrap my head around. The bar-headed goose, which makes the highest elevation migration in the world over the top of the Himalayan mountains. And the black pole warbler, which spends three days flying over the open waters of the Atlantic Ocean in fall, which doesn't sound quite as impressive as the bar-tailed godwit until you remember that a black pole warbler weighs about the same as a ballpoint pen. So that's, again, these, this is it's just mind boggling. But to me, what fascinates me just as much as what my migrating birds do and how they do it is how we even figured out in the first place that birds were doing this. And that's really what my book is about. And it's what I'm here to talk about tonight. So before I really dive in, I wanna give just a little bit more background about myself and how this book came to be. Before COVID, I worked for the full-time for the American Ornithological Society, which is the big professional organization for scientists who study birds. And I was basically a one-person communications department for them. And a big part of my role there was reading scientific papers that were being published in AOS's two peer-reviewed journals, which you can see here that they were, at, the, at the time they were called the Auk and the Condor and turning those papers into blog posts and social media posts and press releases and things like that. And so I spent a lot of time talking to researchers and a lot of time reading the research that was coming out. And I don't know how many, if any of you are already familiar with the structure of scientific papers, but they all follow the same basic format. They have an introduction where the scientists kind of lay out what they studied and why, and then a method section where they talk about how exactly they did their projects. And then there's the results and discussion where they explain what they found and why it mattered. And so when I was reading just paper after paper about new bird research coming out, I kept getting stuck on what I think is usually kind of the boring section that people skip over to get to the good stuff, which is the methods. I didn't know, or if I had learned at some point in the past, I had forgotten that you can study bird migration using weather radar. And you can study it by passively recording the calls of birds passing overhead. And you can study it by analyzing rare hydrogen isotopes in bird feathers. And I was just fascinated by all of these things and started wondering who figured this out and how and how does it even work? And so when COVID hit and I became part of the statistic of however many millions of women it was who left their full-time jobs at the beginning of COVID because of caregiving responsibilities, I decided that maybe what I should do is write a book proposal. And that's what led to the book that's coming out in just under a month. And of course, in doing this, I was joining a really long tradition. People had been wondering about bird migration for a really long time. 
going all the way back to this guy, this is Aristotle. And he was, I think, the first person to write down a theory about what was going on with birds when they disappeared with the seasons. He thought that maybe swallows were disappeared to hibernate in tree crevices. He also thought that maybe the common red starts that he saw in summer were turning into the European robins that he saw in winter, which I guess isn't that outlandish because there are a lot of birds, of course, that change their plumage with the seasons. But it doesn't seem to have occurred to him that maybe what was really going on was just that the birds were leaving. Now, my favorite wrong theory about bird migration uh, comes from the 17th century. There was a minister and educator named Charles Morton who wrote a whole essay laying out his big theory about what was the deal with birds. And his idea was that when birds disappeared for the winter, they must be flying to the moon. So weirdly, he was closer to the truth than Aristotle. He did underestimate how far it was to the moon and he overestimated how fast birds could fly, and he wasn't really aware of the whole oxygen problem. But he did speculate that birds might be spurred to move to new areas by changes in weather and the food supply, and he even thought that body fat might be part of what helped sustain them on this journey. And now we know that putting on body fat is a big part of how birds prepare for migration. But the first hard evidence that birds were actually flying back and forth between continents, not going to the moon and back or some other weird thing like that, was this. So this is a stork that was shot in Germany in 1822. And when the hunter who had shot it went to pick it up, he discovered that it already had a gigantic spear through its neck, which it had apparently been carrying around for quite a while. Eventually, a local newspaper paid to have the wood and iron in the spear analyzed, and they concluded that it had originated in Africa. And so this poor bird got speared through the neck by a hunter in Africa, survived, migrated all the way back to Germany with this thing through its neck only to get shot by another hunter there. And this, this bird is still on display at a German natural history museum. You could go visit it. Uh, Germans love to make up new compound words for everything. So they called this the Pfeilstork, which is German for arrow stork, although it is a spear, not an arrow. And this was really the first hard concrete evidence that birds migrate between continents. It was essentially the starting gun for the modern study of bird migration. And ever since, people have been trying to figure out where birds go and when and why. And as technology has advanced, we've applied basically every major technological leap forward of the last century to try to answer some of these questions. Now, in my book, I cover a lot of ground. I go all the way from bird banding up to the latest high-tech things like high-volume genetic sequencing and miniaturized tracking devices. But when I thought about how I wanted to adapt this into a 45 minute talk, I decided that the easiest and most fun thing to do would be to just zoom in on three of my favorite stories from the book. So I'm gonna share the stories of three of my favorite scientists who appear in the book. And at the end, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the concept of migratory connectivity and why this is so important for bird conservation. And I hope that you will come away from this evening with a new appreciation of all the hard work and creativity that went into uncovering every GWIS fact you hear about bird migration. So the first tactic I wanna talk about for figuring out what migratory birds are doing is one that I hadn't even heard of before I started doing the research for this book, which is moon watching. So most birds migrate at night, I'm sure a lot of you know, and that means you need to get kind of creative to see what exactly they're doing. And today we have all sorts of tools like, ra like radar and satellite telemetry to help us spy on migrating birds. But before any of that technology was developed, this guy, George Lowry, came up with a clever way to do it using just a telescope. So George Lowry was born in Louisiana in 1913. He completed his master's degree from the, he was, he was interested in birds ever since he was a kid. And he completed his master's degree from the University of Louisiana in Baton Rouge in 1936 and never left. He stayed on there for the rest of his career, except for leaving briefly at one point to do a PhD. He was an instructor and an ornithologist, and he helped found LSU's Museum of Zoology, which is still active today. Now, living in Southern Louisiana, he would have been really familiar with the phenomenon, with the phenomenon, excuse me, of fallout, which Again, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this. It's where birds that have been migrating north across the Gulf in spring, depending on weather conditions, basically just fall out of the sky at the very first bit of land they see. And so you can get these amazing clouds of migrants just filling the trees. And although there wasn't really any way to prove it at the time, most ornithologists in the early 20th century thought that it was likely that migrating birds did cross over the open water of the Gulf of Mexico on a regular basis. Um, 
so doing this. And then, and, but in the 1940s, another guy named George Williams, there are, there are two Georges in this story, I apologize. George Williams came along and said, no, that this absolutely can't be what's happening. There's no way that all these birds would choose to fly over 500 miles of open water when Mexico is right there. So his idea was that even though people never really saw huge numbers of migrants passing through Mexico, these birds must just be sticking to a narrow route along the coast or flying too high to be observed. Basically, he, George Williams said that the birds must be going through Mexico. We're just not looking hard enough. George Lowry was super annoyed by this because he had seen the evidence of migration over the Gulf with his own eyes with fallout, and he was really determined to prove Williams wrong. So Lowry started thinking about what was there some tool that he could use to show that my, the birds really did migrate over the Gulf of Mexico. And he recalled some quirky papers from the beginning of the 20th century where ornithologists had described being able to see the silhouettes of migrating birds passing in front of the disk of the full moon at night. And Lowry thought, maybe there's something there. Maybe he could do something with that. Luckily for him, there was also an astronomer working at LSU at the time who was an avid birder. And so Lowry and this astronomer worked together to come up with a set of equations that would let them take raw data on the number and direction of birds that they could see passing in front of the moon in a, in a given amount of time and turn that into an estimate of the total number of birds crossing an imaginary one mile line on the Earth's surface every hour. This is a little bit technical sounding, but basically what it amounted to was it would let Lowry directly compare the amount of migration in one time and place with the amount of migration happening in another time and place. Lowry called this the migration traffic rate, and he thought that he finally had a tool to demonstrate the volume of birds passing over the Gulf. So in April 1945, George Lowry packed up a telescope. He got on board a boat headed across the Gulf of Mexico for a port on the Yucatan Peninsula. And that first night out, of, out at sea, he set up his telescope on the deck and he pointed it up at the moon over the Gulf and he looked through the eyepiece. And George Lowry did not have a lot of experience at sea, so he had not anticipated the fact, the fact that the moon would be bobbing up and down with the waves in and out of sight and he could not see anything well enough to count. He was undeterred. He waited until the boat got to the Yucatan and docked in calmer waters and tried again, pointing his telescope out over the gulf at the moon in the wee hours of the morning. He was able to tally 12 birds in about 45 minutes, which maybe doesn't sound like a lot, except that it worked out to more than 3,700 birds passing over a one mile line extending out into the gulf every hour. So Lowry had just collected the first hard numerical evidence that trans-gulf migration was real. He knew he was onto something. He was just getting started. His next idea for moon watching was that he was gonna scale it up and recruit volunteers from all across North America, North America to help collect this type of data. And today we call this citizen science or community science. At that point, these, those terms hadn't even been coined yet. Lowry just knew that he had a method to, that had the potential to reveal migration patterns at the scale of the whole continent for the first time. But he couldn't do it alone. And right around this time, this gentleman on the left named Bob Newman arrived on the scene. He was a much younger man then. This is from later in his career. Like Lowry, Bob Newman came to LSU as a graduate student and never left. And these two men formed a working partnership that lasted until Lowry's death in the 1970s. Now, they both passed away decades ago, so I didn't get to talk to either of these guys when I was working on my book. But I did talk to an ornithologist who worked with both of them when he was working on his PhD. And my impression is that in a lot of ways, they were sort of an odd couple. They couldn't have been more different, but they complemented each other really well. And they seemed to have realized that. Lowry was basically an old school gentleman, nat gentleman naturalist. He would have been at home in the 19th century. He was the type who was interested in all sorts of stuff, mammals and things, not just birds. And he would organize expeditions to the jungles of South America to gather more specimens for the museum. He wore a suit and tie even for field work. He was just very old fashioned. Newman was a jokester who approached problems a lot more like a modern scientist. He made it a personal mission to keep up with the latest bird migration research being published all over the world, not just in America. And he even taught himself statistics before that was a common skill for zoologists. So together, uh, George Lowry and Bob Newman came up with a plan to collect a snapshot of migration activity across the entire continent during a single week in October. No one had ever tried anything like this before. 
And this was, of course, before computers. I mean, not really. There were a handful of computers in the country at the time, but they certainly didn't have access to one. No internet. So the way they pulled this off was they spent literally 12 hours a day, according to Bob, what some stuff Bob Newman wrote, writing personal letters to hundreds of potential volunteers talking about how they could make this great contribution to science. And eventually they recruited 2,500 volunteers in 325 locations from Canada to Panama. They did everything they could to, to make sure that this went smoothly. They even went as far as making a how-to pamphlet for observers to make sure that the data collected was as reliable as possible. And it included some illustrations showing the best ways to make yourself comfortable for long stints of staring at the sky. Now, knowing that Bob Newman had a reputation for his sense of humor, I can't decide whether I think, yeah, whether I think, was the stogie mandatory? Exactly. I can't decide whether I think that this figure from their how-to pamphlet was supposed to be funny or whether it was just the 50s. I don't really know. But anyway, in fall 1952, telescopes swung into action across North America. Soon observations were flooding in from every corner of the continent. And again, no computers, no internet. Paper data sheets were stacking up higher and higher on Lowry and Newman's desks. And they realized they had another problem, which is what to do with all of that data. This was before most zoologists had any training in statistics, like I said. They now needed to calculate the average direction and volume of bird migration from hundreds of locations. They needed to look up data on the temperature and wind and movement of cold fronts for each of those locations because they wanted to connect this to weather patterns. They needed to check for patterns and how migration related to weather across the whole continent. And they needed to depict all of this on maps, which they would have to draw by hand. <laughs> it took them 14 years to complete and publish this. It finally came out in 1966. It was published in the AUK, which was one of the same journals that I would be working for 50 years later. Uh, they titled it A Continent-Wide View of Bird Migration on Four Nights in October. They, yes, they needed grad students. They did have grad students. I talked to some of their grad students. It still took like them 14 years. So they had these really amazing painstakingly crafted maps. Um, and I don't know why there's black streaks around the edges on the ocean. I don't know if that was an artifact of when this was scanned or what but they used these black, red, and white arrows to show the direction and volume of different locations on these four nights in October. And you can see these sort of gray swoops are where they superimposed cold fronts and, what, and whatnot, where those were on those nights. And they could see these massive migratory movements that spanned multiple states. And they could see that both um, favorable winds and the movement of cold fronts were related to these with the, big, the heaviest migration occurring in front of advancing cold fronts. If you like to check the weather forecast during bird migration to try and guess when the next big wave of birds is going to hit your area, you might be familiar with this idea of migrants riding advancing cold fronts. But to see this at such a large scale was, was completely new at the time this was published. Nothing like this had been done before. This paper was a blockbuster. It was 40 pages long. It influenced studies of migration for a long time. It was also the last moon watching paper that Lowry and Newman would ever publish. So I have just a couple of photos here. On the left is actually me in my driveway attempting my own evening of moon watching. I, I did not see any birds. It's a lot harder than it sounds. Um, and I discovered pretty quickly why they needed to give people advice on staying comfortable because craning over an eyepiece staring at the very bright moon becomes unpleasant very quickly. And on the right is a setup created by some ornithologists who are trying to kind of bring moon watching back as a technique using video cameras and they're hoping to develop some artificial intelligence tools to tally the birds that they capture on camera. Um, Lowry and Newman did plan to continue their efforts. They wanted to adapt their telescope methods for use in daylight, and they were applying for funding for a new study of migrating birds arriving on the Gulf Coast. But none of that ever came to fruition because the technique that they developed was about to be made mostly obsolete by the rise of a new technology, which was radar. So I'm sure all of you have seen images like this before. This is from the nationwide weather radar system, the same one that you see images from on the Weather Channel with the green and orange blobs to show where rainstorms are. You actually can see some rain on this map on the East Coast. But all those blobs, the round blobs going down the middle of the continent, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, are birds. So generally, they filter out migrating birds and other distractions on the radar images they use for TV weather reports. But birds actually show up really wet, really well on radar. And during migration, big waves of birds moving across the continent show up as the big donut-shaped blobs that you can see here. 
When I first started researching radar ornithology, it took me a little bit to wrap my head around why birds appear as round blobs, but it's just that each individual radar station has a field of view basically shaped like a cone starting at the location of the radar station on the ground and then expanding out up into the sky. So as huge numbers of birds take off in the evening and rise up and fill the whole field of view of a radar station, you just get a round blob. But when people first started using radar in a big way, it hadn't occurred to anyone yet that they might pick up birds. They, were more, they weren't looking for rain either. They were more concerned with airplanes because of course radar first got its start during World War II. So I'm gonna get technical just for a second here. Radar stands for radio detection and ranging. And the way that it works is that a special transmitter beams out radio waves and they bounce off objects in their path. Some of their energy is reflected back to the radar equipment. And how much energy comes back and the angle that it comes in at tells you something about the size and distance of the objects that the radio waves are running up against. It's like sonar or echolocation, but with radio waves instead of sound. So British scientists had demonstrated in 1935 that they could detect planes up to eight miles away using just a regular radio transmitter owned by the BBC. By the time World War II officially broke out, they had already built radar stations up and down the British coast to detect incoming planes from the mainland. But almost immediately, the operators of these radar stations started picking up mysterious signals, which unlike planes that sort of plotted along at consistent speeds and trajectories, these mystery radar signals would wax and wane and change direction suddenly. Supposedly, at one point, a red alert was sounded and British fighter planes were ordered into the skies to intercept strange signals coming in across the English Channel only to find nothing there. And exasperated radar operators started calling these angels, radar angels. Now, while this was going on, this guy, my second of the three migration innovators we're going to learn about tonight, had been teaching science at a secondary school in southwestern England. His name was David Lack, and he didn't know it yet, but he was about to become the father of radar ornithology. So Lack had always been interested in birds. He had a background in ornithology from his time at Cambridge. In 1938, he took a year off of his teaching job to go to the Galapagos Islands to study Darwin's famous finches, and he got back to the UK just as war was breaking out. Now, Lack later wrote a bit of a memoir about the early years of his career, and so I'm going to read you a direct quote about what happened next as, we, as he arrives back in England at the, at the eve of the war. Let's see here. Hang on. I had become a pacifist at the age of 17. And in the autumn of 1940, I decided that I ought to leave my job at the school and work with a pacifist unit. So he had joined a pacifist organization. I spent a trial night in the East End of London during heavy raids, but was so put off by the pacifists' earnest attitudes and so excited by the flashes and bangs that I was immediately converted from pacifism. A month later, the Central Register for Scientific Workers sent me to interview for an unspecified job. As a biologist, you will of course have learned a lot of physics, the interviewer said. I'm afraid not, I answered. Well, I expect your maths is of a high standard. I'm afraid not. Then very doubtfully, I fear this job will often entail going out in the wet and cold in the dark. Would you mind that? Not at all. So I was taken on and 10 days later set off from London with 19 other biologists on a mystery coach tour. It's always fun to discover that the historical person you're writing about had a sense of humor. Anyway, you can see where this was going. Lack was assigned to a job working on radar systems because apparently anyone with any scientific background whatsoever was being put to work working on radar systems. His first posting was in the Orkneys, which is a wet, windy, remote group of islands off the north end of Scotland. Lack was apparently the only person happy to be sent there because the birding was really good. He got to spend all his off hours scrambling over rocks looking for puffins and skuas. After that, on a tour of radar installations up and down the British coast, he was reintroduced to an old acquaintance of his from Cambridge named George Varley. Varley was an entomologist um, before the war, but like Lack, he had now been assigned to work on radar. And it was Varley who introduced Lack to the mystery of the angels plaguing the radar operators. Now, David Lack was familiar with the behavior of birds in flight. And he knew pretty much immediately what, what must actually be making these mysterious signals. He was like, it's birds, guys. But there were a lot of skeptics. So Lack and Varley had to get pretty creative trying to prove it. At one point, they had an officer tie a dead gull to a balloon and send it up into the air just to prove that it was at least possible for a bird to produce a radar signal. Finally, in September 1941, Varley managed to use a powerful telescope to confirm that 
the source of the signal being tracked offshore in real time was actually a, was was in fact a flock of gannets, as which is the seabird you can see here. As the war continued, Black and Farley continued to collect radar observations that they believed represented birds. The technology was advancing really quickly, and while at the beginning of the war, only big birds like gannets and geese would show up on radar, pretty soon they were detecting flocks of smaller birds like starlings. And they continued to gather data that confirmed that the characteristics of the so-called angels, like their airspeed and their tendency to fly with or against the wind instead of perpendicular to it, were all consistent with the behavior of birds in flight. Not everyone was convinced, and I do want to read another brief quote that gives you a sense of George Lacks, or David Lacks, sorry, sense of humor. Um, at one meeting, he wrote, after the physicists had again gravely explained that clouds of ions must be responsible, Farley with equal gravity accepted their view, provided that the ions were wrapped in feathers. I like this guy, he was funny. But yeah, they stuck with it. In 1945, as the end of the war neared, they finally got permission to publish their previously top secret findings in the journal Nature. Today, Lack, who died in 1973, is better remembered for the book he wrote about Darwin's finches, but this publication essentially kicked off a whole subfield now known as radar ornithology. After the war, of course, meteorologists adopted radar, and large flocks of birds showed up just as well on weather radar as they had on military radar. It was actually a grad student working with George Lowry, the moon watching guy in Louisiana, who first developed the use of weather radar to study birds and used it to look at the behavior of flocks arriving on the Louisiana coast after crossing the Gulf, the same sort of thing that Lowry used moon watching for. Over time, um, advances like the introduction of Doppler technology have made it possible to gather better and better information about migrating birds this way. In 2018, a paper was published that I think really shows the power of radar data. Uh, two scientists downloaded the full archive of radar data for every single evening since the current generation of North American weather radar was installed. This was more than 150,000 individual radar scans spanning 23 years. And they used computer analysis to see how weather factors like temperature and wind and air pressure predicted the appearance of big migration movements on radar. This is basically the exact same thing that Lowry and Newman were doing, just with radar and computers. Their math explained almost 80% of the variation in the amount of migration from night to night, and they could predict big migratory movements several days in advance. So if you've ever used BirdCast, which is the website uh, run by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that forecasts the amount of migration that's going to be happening in different parts of the country, that's this, this is the technology that it's, that it's based on. It's based on these weather radar analyses. And it is all thanks to a witty, a witty science teacher from Devonshire who realized what must really be going on with the mysterious angels that were annoying the radar operators guarding England from the Nazis. Now, of course, radar isn't the only way to put radio waves to work tracking birds. And this brings me to my third and favorite migration maverick, which is this guy. So this man's name is Bill Cochran. In the mid-1950s, he was a young Navy veteran living in Illinois, working on an electrical engineering degree part-time while also working for a brand new television station based in the city of Champaign. One morning, he went to check on his employer's transmitter tower on the outskirts of town, and there he found an ornithologist from the University of Illinois and his wife picking dead birds up off the ground. The ornithologist's name was Richard Graber. He was studying tower kills, which are the phenomenon where flocks of birds fly into communications towers and are killed by the impact. Cochran was intrigued by this, and soon he was spending all of his spare time tinkering together gadgets to help uh, Richard Graber in his work. Now, Bill Cochran appears in more chapters of my book than any other single researcher. The first project that he and Graber worked on together was figuring out a way to record the nocturnal flight calls of birds flying overhead. They were actually the first people to record nocturnal flight calls. And one of my favorite little stories from the whole book is Bill Cochran, the, again, student electrical engineer, figuring out how to rig a tape recorder up with bicycle axles to hold the 6,000 feet of tape that they would need to record an entire night of, of nocturnal flight calls because no, no digital recorders yet. But the chapter where in my book where Bill Cochran looms largest is the one on radio telemetry. So telemetry means transmitting data from one place to another. And it was the invention of the transistor in 1947 that made radio telemetry really feasible for the first time. 
I got to tell you, when I started writing this book, I did not think I was going to be learning about things like the invention of the transistor, but bird migration really touches on everything. So before this, radios relied on big, bulky, breakable vacuum tubes to amplify the signals that they sent out. Transistors provided a lightweight, efficient, and durable way of doing the same thing, and they made it possible to start adapting radios for all sorts of tasks that they wouldn't have been suited for before, including transmitting all kinds of data from one place to another. One of the first groups to really jump on this was the US Navy. They started experimenting with things like using radio signals to transmit real-time data on a pilot's vital signs to someone monitoring them from the ground and to study the effectiveness of cold water suits for sailors by transmitting the data on the temperature inside the suit. And it did not take long for wildlife researchers to start borrowing these same techniques. In 1957, Scientists in Antarctica used the system from the cold water suit test to monitor the temperature of a penguin egg during incubation. That's what's going on here. That's a penguin in the lower right. Um, that same year, a group of researchers in Maryland borrowed some ideas from the jet pilot project and surgically implanted transmitters and woodchucks to track them over a short, over a short area of, of ground. Soon, big engineering firms like Honeywell were getting involved, trying to design radio tracking systems that they could sell to wildlife biologists to use to track animals' movements. But they were basically trying things like strapping a metal box containing a radio transmitter onto the back of a grouse and sending it off into the bushes. And a, metal, a box shaped metal backpack on a grouse really didn't work very well in the field. So for wildlife telemetry to really take off, someone was literally going to have to think outside the box. Ha <laughs> ha, forgive me. And that someone turned out to be Bill Cochran. So this is Sputnik which was launched in 1957, the same year as those experiments with penguins and woodchucks. And Sputnik comes into this story because it really inspired new interest in radio transmissions around the world. And soon Bill Cochran, who still had not actually finished that electrical engineering degree, but was apparently a bit of a savant with transistors, had picked up more part-time work helping an astronomer who was building radio beacons for some of the first US satellites that were going to be launched in response to Sputnik. Cochran was also still doing work with Graeber and his colleagues over at the Illinois Natural History Survey. And pretty soon someone suggested that they try combining Cochran's two side gigs and putting one of his radio transmitters on a duck to see what would happen. Why not? So they strapped the transmitter onto this bird using a metal band over its chest. And although they hadn't really planned this, it turned out that the bird's breathing distorted the metal band in a way that affected the radio signal. And so when they released the duck, they could track its respiratory rate as it flew, and they had accidentally collected the first data on the vital signs of a bird in flight. This was basically the beginning of the rest of Bill Cochran's career. He, he thought this was super cool. Building a radio transmitter to be worn by an animal requires making trade-offs among a long list of factors, a, like a longer antenna will give you a stronger signal and a bigger battery will give you a longer lasting transmitter, but they both add weight. Cochran, who would not officially finish that electrical engineering degree for several more years, turned out to be really good at getting this balance just right. He favored designs that were as small and simple and compact as possible. And instead of putting the components in the metal box, he dipped the whole assembly in plastic resin to seal and waterproof everything together. So Cochran first worked with an Illinois biologist who was looking for a more accurate way to survey the local cottontail rabbit population. The transmitter, the rabbit transmitters that Cochran built weighed a third of an ounce and had a range of up to two miles. Cochran didn't initially realize the significance of what he just achieved, but when the biologist he was working with gave a presentation about this project at a mammalogy conference in 1961, Cochran suddenly found himself inundated with job offers for biologists throughout the region. Now, one of the one of the many things that's amazing to me about Bill Cochran is that he didn't try to turn this into a big money job offer with Honeywell or another engineering firm. And he didn't even try to patent anything that he invented. Quite the opposite. He actually let anyone who wanted to learn how to do what he did come and stay at the spare room at his house and build transmitters with him in his basement. And by 1965, he was building transmitters small enough that they could be placed on songbirds. Now, tracking a migrating songbird requires you to do that, you have to stay within range of its transmitter. And these transmitters still only had a range of a few miles. So if they wanted to try putting one of Bill's transmitters on a bird and seeing where it went, they would need to they would also need to have a way to follow it. So Cochran's old friend and mentor, the ornithologist Richard Graber, found a pilot 
who was willing to follow a migrating radio tagged thrush at night in a small plane. So on the left, you can see the plane that they used. They called it the porcupine, because I don't know if you can see all the antenna poking out of its back. In May 1965, they captured a gray cheeked thrush outside Urbana, Illinois. Uh, they, they chose thrushes partly because they were big for a songbird, so they were hefty enough to carry a transmitter, and partly just because they were one of the birds that Richard Graber studied, so he knew a lot about them. They trimmed the feathers from a little patch on this bird's back, and they stuck on a transmitter using eyelash glue. This is the glue that's used to attach false eyelashes. It's actually really, um, really popular for this sort of use with wildlife biologists because it doesn't irritate the skin and it wears off on its own eventually. And this is a bit of a tangent, but I just love the mental image of generations of like crusty macho wildlife biologists having to learn exactly where the eyelash glue is at the local cosmetic store so they can go stock up. So that night in May 1965, Graber and his pilot followed this thrush north for 400 miles before turning back, 200 of which were over the open water of Lake Michigan. Richard Graber was so awe-inspired, was so inspired by the experience of sitting in this little plane at night in the dark, you, you, hearing the beep, beep, beep of this bird out there somewhere that he later compared it to the awe that he felt watching the coverage of the Apollo missions. And Bill Cochran was just getting started. The stories only get better. In 1973, Bill Cochran and a young student named Charles Welling, who he convinced to drive him, tagged another thrush passing through Illinois, this time a Swainson's thrush, and they spent a full week following it almost a thousand miles all the way from Illinois across the Canadian border and into Manitoba in a station wagon with a hole cut in the top for their radio receiver. You can see the station wagon here with this giant rig sticking out of the top of it. When I read this, when I first read this paper, I just couldn't believe that this really happened. There's so many just wild stories from this trip. Apparently at one point, Charles Welling, the student who was driving Cochrane, basically spent a night in jail. A suspicious police over pol bleh, police officer pulled them over in rural Minnesota, and they didn't want to stop for very long and lose the bird. So Cochrane just left Welling, Welling there with the police officer, kept on driving. Kept on going. Came down to the mysterious spot. Chance have been very pleasant. Um, every day and every night to, uh oh, I hope you guys can still hear me. It says my internet connection is unstable. Uh, every day and every night, uh, they have ground since it covered each night and able to stick with the bird. How the dirt set out in each night, the bird's position changed relative to my. So this was some of the first evidence that was worth the first real world evidence that birds could use this magnetic field for navigation. They were finally forced to stop. Oh, shoot. This is I'm breaking up. I'm so sorry, everyone. I, um, they were finally forced to stop when their car's engine gave out after they crossed into Canada. Um, yeah, just an amazing story. It's getting better. Thank you. I'm so sorry. I don't know why I'm having this problem. So Bill Cochran was even the first person to propose the idea of tracking wildlife via satellite. He about his work building radio beacons for satellites and Brad designed where they from up there an official pitch and was a bit pre the Apollo program. Uh, satellite telemetry wouldn't be really going for another decade. But Bill Cochran never really got the hang of the publishing system. He was always a bit of an outsider. By the late 1990s, he'd left the Natural History Survey on what I gather were he kept building radio systems in his garage right up to the beginning of the century. I had the very great good fortune to working on this book. I got to visit him at his home. The station wagon was still in it's still in the drive.
people more aware of all the things that he accomplished. Oh, shoot. I'm gone. All right. I'm going to keep going and hope that it comes back. I'm so sorry, folks. Ah, this is I'm gone. <laughs> Suspense over what happened with Bill. Oh, dear. This is tragic. It's, it's better now. Okay. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my talk. I'll, okay. Um, All right. Is it better now? It, it seems better now. I'm wondering whether you might just be able to start from the arrest. Could you just go from the arrest again? <laughs> if, it, if it's sorry to kind of make you repeat yourself, but we couldn't yeah, really hear it much after that, but it seems better now. Yeah, I'm so sorry that that's happening. I've never had problems with my internet before. I don't know if it's different in the evening because I'm not usually on Zoom calls in the evening. So yeah, um, Bill did not get arrested. He left his young student driver there with the cop because he didn't want to lose the bird. He kept driving, left the left poor Charles Welling there with, with the police in Minnesota, followed the bird until it set down at dawn and then turned around and doubled back to straighten things out with the police and get Charles Welling and, and catch up with the bird. I know this poor student. So they followed this bird all the way across the, the border into Canada when their engine finally gave out. And because they were able to follow it for such a long time, they got to track how its heading changed as the bird's position changed relative to magnetic north. And it they provided some of the first real world evidence that um, birds really could navigate using the Earth's magnetic field. I got to meet Bill. He's, he, I, I got to talk to him several times while I was researching the book. I even got to go to his house in Illinois where this station wagon is still in the driveway. And he was, he was still building transmitters for scientists up into the beginning of the 21st century. He's just a hilarious character. Sadly, he passed away last summer at the age of 90. Um, and I, I really believe that he is an unsung hero of 20th century science. And I'm really happy that my book is hopefully going to make people more aware of everything that he accomplished. Can you all still hear me? Am I back? Is this working now? I hope. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, right now. Okay. Yay. Okay. Good. Thank you. I'm so I'm so sorry about that, everyone. I what a what a moment for it to cut out too. So I'm I'm coming to the end of my talk here. I'm gonna try to try to wrap it up quickly just in case I cut out again. Um let's see. Uh, tonight, I chose to, I, I partly chose to talk about three of these scientists who were mostly active decades ago uh, to get around the possibility of anyone who I was talking about being in the audience themselves, because that would just be really awkward. I am going to be giving some talks at ornithology conferences. And if you read the, if you get a chance to read the whole book, and I do also talk in there about a lot of the more recent developments in the field, like I said, um, I get, to, I, I get into artificial intelligence and high volume genetic sequencing and the latest teeny tiny tracking devices and all this stuff. And thanks to all these recent high tech advances, we have a clearer, more detailed picture of bird migration now than, than ever before. And one of the new concepts that's emerged as we've gotten this better and better data is a phrase you may have heard called migratory connectivity, which just refers to the geographic links between different parts of birds annual cycles. So I'm going to I'm going to try to go through this quickly. The easiest way to illustrate this is with a map. Say we have an imaginary bird species that has an eastern breeding population and a western breeding population. When these birds all head south for the winter, if birds from both breeding populations kind of wrinkle, mingle throughout their winter range, this is weak migratory connectivity. If birds from the east go one place and first birds from the west go to another place, this is what scientists would call strong migratory connectivity. This really matters because without this level of detail, it's really hard to, pin to pinpoint where the problems are for a species that's declining. So say that in our hypothetical bird species, the Eastern population is declining and the Western one is not, all the conservation and habitat protection that you could possibly do in the breeding range of this Eastern population isn't gonna make any difference if the real population is that in winter, those birds are all heading off to one specific spot in North America that's being destroyed by logging. So new tra tracking technologies are helping us figure out these patterns. And that's good because right now birds kind of need all the help they can get. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with what's been called the 3 billion birds paper, which was this big study that was published in 2019 that showed that there are 2.9 billion fewer breeding birds in North America than there were in 1970, which is just a staggering loss. Researchers and wildlife managers have really been scrambling to figure out how to stop the bleeding. 
And I needed to write some sort of a conclusion for my book. And I decided that the best way to do it would be to reach out to a couple of the leading experts on migratory bird conservation and ask them whether some of these new tracking technologies might be part of the answer to help us tackle this and what they think of what they think the future might hold. So I talked to Pete Mara, who is one of the co-authors on this paper and is also the co-founder of the Road to Recovery Initiative that grew out of it, and to Jill Deppy, the director of the Audubon Society's Migratory Bird Initiative. And I felt really privileged that they both humored me when I wanted to call them up and ask them sort of laughably broad questions like, what is the state of migratory bird conservation today? And are you hopeful about the future? But they were really nice about it and they had strikingly similar things to say. Um, they agreed that despite all the ever more detailed migration research happening now, we still need even more data to understand what's behind the declines of many of these species. We, we still don't know enough. They agreed that there's a need to consolidate the data that is being collected and get it into the hands of policymakers and conservation activists to work across international borders, to incorporate more partners in the social sciences and more perspectives from indigenous people. And to my surprise, they both insisted that they feel hopeful about the future for migratory birds. And so I wanna conclude by reading a little bit of what Pete Mara said to me when I talked to him about this. He said, I'm very optimistic. We've done this in the past, we've corrected other environmental issues, and now we have to deal with climate change. So while it seems like there's this overwhelm overwhelming deluge of negative issues and challenges with getting people on board with these things and constant pressures on nature, I choose to be optimistic and hopeful just because I don't see any benefit of being pessimistic or having a lack of hope. I just don't choose to take that route. Don't get me wrong, there are times when I might be negative or spiraling down into a pit of agony, but I'm not gonna do that. And I thought those were wise words. And I don't know about you all, but when I find myself spiraling down into a pit of agony, I usually just go birding. So that is the conclusion of my talk. I apologize again for the technical technical hiccup in the middle of there. This is my this is my first time doing a virtual talk. And so I don't know if maybe my internet signal isn't as strong in the evening. I'm gonna have to look into it. Um, I wanna thank Chris and Pasadena Audubon for inviting me. I think I do have time to answer a few questions. Um, I put up here my social media information and my website where I have an email list that you can sign up for. Uh, the book is not available for purchase yet. It comes out on March 14th, but it is available for pre-order online or at your local bookstore. And I guess, Kira, can I, can I move myself? Right. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you, if any of you hearing this talk decide to pre-order it, you can forward me, just, just email me your pre-order confirmation or where you pre-ordered it from along with your mailing address at rebecca.heisman and gmail. And I would love to sign, send you a signed book plate so that you can have a signed copy of the book. So yeah, thank you again. And I am I'm happy to answer questions. Great, Th thank you so much. This is real, it, it's wonderful, it's amazing stuff. And I wanna say, I've, uh, Re Rebecca kindly provided me with a review copy of, of the book. And there are so many more amazing stories in, in this book. Like I, I was just completely gobsmacked by the fact that we can now take a tiny piece of a feather of a bird that was collected, say, three quarters of a century ago and gain some knowledge about where that bird lived on the earth. It, it, it's amazing stuff that's going on. Uh, having, having said that, I, I'm curious, uh, Rebecca, what are there any... You, you mentioned at the end that uh, that uh, scientists still would like to know a lot more about bird migration. Are there are there big points that are still, you know, is, is there like a top list of what scientists would like to know? I think that this migratory connectivity concept and what people also call full annual cycle research is kind of where it's headed right now, just drilling down into these really fine levels of detail, not just about where a certain species goes in winter, but where all the individual subpopulations of that species go in winter so that we can really create these intricate detailed maps kind of connecting the dots of, of where, you know, where different population segments spend different times of the year, just because that's the, that's the level of detail that's really needed to kind of pinpoint conservation actions. I think that's where kind of a lot of the excitement that's in this field is now. I see. I've got a quick, uh, maybe related question. And this is something that's always bugged me. Uh, and that is, how do birds know where to go? I mean, we really, <laughs> has, uh, and I know this is this is not really what your book is addressing, yeah. what your book is addressing, but you've 
you know, you worked at AOS, you've seen a lot of papers. Do we know any more about like where inside a bird's brain is is the knowledge of where the heck they should go every autumn? Um, so I'm not, I'm not, as you said, this isn't really what the Burke's book is about. And so with the big caveat that I'm not an expert on this, they have a lot of different methods. Um, there's certainly a little bit of just genetic hardwiring at play. Um, they, birds certainly can navigate using the stars. People did, there were some famous experiments done decades ago where they put birds under planetariums so that they could rotate the artificial sky above them and see how they changed their, their orientation. Right. Um, they can use the sun also. They can, some birds uh, use landmarks but visible on the ground beneath them. Um, and of course, they, as I alluded to briefly, birds can also sense the Earth's magnetic field. And for th they, they figured that out by, again, like manipulating magnetic fields around birds in laboratories. Oh yeah, polarized light also, I, I think right. is one. Again, this isn't yeah. my area of expertise. Right. Um, they've still been trying for a long time to figure out how birds sense the Earth's magnetic field. And the current leading theory is that it actually has to do with quantum physics. There's some sort of weird quantum effects with light sensitive proteins in birds' eyeballs. Right. That like yeah. react to the Earth's magnetic field. Yeah. It's crazy. I've, yeah, I've read that. None of this <laughs> explains though, how they know where to go, but you know, anyway, <laughs> yeah. topic for another speaker. Uh, there, there, there is a interesting question in, in the chat. Uh, you, you'd mentioned uh, AI is being used in, in mm -hmm. bird migration stuff. Can you talk a bit more about that? What kind of uh, promise that, that, that is uh, bringing us? Yeah, that came up at a couple points. Um, I mentioned nocturnal flight call recording really briefly with that project where they rigged up a tape recorder with a bicycle axle. One of the big limitations on nocturnal, the use of nocturnal flight, flight call recording in migration research has just been that someone then has to listen to the recording and like eight hours of recording and pick out all the calls and then identify the calls. And so one promising area for artificial intelligence and machine learning is A, like picking up where in an eight hour long recording calls are and then B, identifying those calls to kind of streamline that and take a lot of the labor out of it. I actually talked to a machine learning expert at Microsoft when I was researching the book to make sure that I could explain accurately how machine learning works. And the, the paper that I threw up there, uh, the radar one where they used like 150,000 radar scans is also essentially, you know, like a big data artificial intelligence type application. So there's definitely a lot of, a lot of uses for machine learning popping up in ornithology as in all fields at this point. Right. You know, that, that makes me, uh, you mentioned the, oh, the was it 150,000 uh, radar scans? It just, yeah. one thing that pops up again and again in your book is the value of data that's been collected in the past. Some, you know, whether it's uh, things like someone remembering, you know, someone saving all these old radar maps or someone saving, you know, mounted birds for, for decades in, in a museum or someone, uh, or the the thousands and millions of people that 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 uh, post post their uh, their bird sightings in eBird, it 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 really strikes me like the the great value and the great need to preserve past records. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. The, the bird banding data set in particular, it's amazing how they're using that data now for purposes that no one was thinking about when bird banding data got started. It, I keep coming back to this Earth's magnetic field thing, but a paper just came out using the decades and decades and decades of bird banding or bird banding records to show that vagrancy, like vagrancy in bird migrants, like migrants turning up where they shouldn't be, increases during periods of geomagnetic disturbance, which I was just flabbergasted by. That's so cool. That is so cool. That is so cool. Uh, well, anyway, uh, it's I as I said, I, I can't. I can't praise the book enough. It, it's so for if if you're a bird geek, th I mean this 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 is absolutely the book. There are so many amazing stories, and I have to say, I just I wish I could reach back into the past and just tell all these folks thanks, thanks for like you know the, the the all the hours of work they put in and all all the uh, the dedication to go out there and collect all this data over all these decades. Uh, and I, I guess I'd just like to thank you again for uh, for agreeing to speak tonight. Uh, I perhaps some Pasadena folks will see you in person down in uh, down in San Diego. Yeah, uh, I'm um, I'm giving the same talk. So if you come hear me there, you've already heard the talk. Although then you won't have to deal with technical difficulties. So anyway, well, no, we're all we're all uh, 
Uh, we're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, to those of you watching tonight, uh, we're, we're going to uh, uh, post Rebecca's uh, talk on, on YouTube and uh, you'll be able to uh, pass it on, share it, uh, share it with uh, all your birder friends. And uh, Rebecca, thank you once again. And uh, Luke, I think, and Lois, back to you. Uh, yeah, I just want to say thanks uh, to Rebecca too. I mean, that was a fantastic talk, really, really entertaining and interesting stuff. It kind of made me think about um, I, I was kind of involved in a lot of raptor research, and I remember listening to the stories of kind of the early days of working, working out which routes kind of broadwinged hawks migrated through the northeast, and they were kind of like following them on a with a micro light or or something. Friends of mine, or or kind of. I, friends of friends kind of generation or two before me but um i remember them talking about uh the things and the, the stories made me think of this there was a senator called william proxmire who used to do this thing called the golden fleece and it was these ridiculous projects that the american government were funding you know and they were always terrified that their project he wrote three books about it that, that their re research would end up in the in the book of you know ridiculous things that the American government gave scientists money for. So just those stories were really fantastic and interesting to, to listen to. So thanks for that. Lois, do you need to add anything to? No, just thanks. I thought it was fascinating as well. Um, and I'm looking forward to migration with all this in mind, which is coming right up. Yeah. Thank you all again for having me and, and for being my guinea pigs, because this is my first time giving the talk. So. Oh, it's it. great. Thank you so much. And uh, I guess, uh, good night, everyone. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you again. She was on Zoom for, from someplace, probably San Diego, where she lives or something like that. Yeah.